The year, 1979. The third and last Bond movie directed by Lewis Gilbert, James Bond returns to us in a surprise upset, with audiences fully expecting, for your eyes only, as promised at the end of The Spy Love Me. But movies like Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the upcoming Star Trek movie, and more, made studio execs change tactics. And this is the movie we get, loosely titled after a novel by Ian Fleming, the plot follows Sir Hugo Drax in his plot to restart and rule a master human race by first completely killing off everyone else on the planet, while James Bond rushes around three continents and space to stop him in... Moonraker. Good evening, 003. The following is for your ears only and is classified above top secret by Her Majesty's Secret Service. Our contact with the We Can Make This Work, probably... Podcast Network intercepted an encrypted audio message regarding podcasters assembled. For this season, the Podcast Network is looking to recruit field operatives from around the world to reminisce about the Bond movies and a countdown to the latest film in the franchise, No Time to Die. Your primary objective is to infiltrate podcasters assembled by recording and uploading your submissions at probablywork.com, utilizing a two-way communications device with a built-in microphone, the latest from QBranch. For a full mission report, Go to probablywork.com. We're all counting on you, 003. Podcasters assemble. In space. Eric Slater here from Epic Fails of History and Too Young for This Trek. This is Troidal Power. This is MC. From the best animated shows ever. So far. This is Justin Aki, graphic designer and one half of Significant Honor Co. I'm Megan and I'm the other half of Significant Honor Co. Yo, this is Corey Torgerson, photographer, film nut, and podcast hopper. Hello, my name is Ben Thompson. I'm from badassoftheweek.com. This is Bill from the Tarviran podcast. And this is Moonraker. Oh boy. Today we're watching Moonraker, the Elon Musk story. 1979's Moonraker is the 11th Bond movie and is based on the third Bond novel. Sort of. Now, I feel like I know most people's opinion on this film, uh, but it's not mine. I bloody, bloody love this movie. Uh, it is James Bond meets Star Wars, and it's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> So going into this, obviously a Moonraker, it's James Bond in space. How could it possibly be bad? Don't look too deep into this film. Just sit back, put your arms behind your head, crack out some popcorn, and enjoy one of the wildest rides the Bond's ever going to take you on. We open with the space shuttle being carried by a 747, and interestingly enough, this is the uh, this is 1979, and the space shuttle wasn't actually flown for the first time until 1981. So it looks almost retro to us looking at the space shuttle, but at the time, this was a thing that was going to start flying in a couple of years. The movie starts off with two agents who are in storage, sleeping. They're sleeper agents. Two guys sneak into a British flight of an American shuttlecraft, and they're just like stolen. The movie opens with the Moonraker space shuttle being stolen from the back of a plane. This movie was bonkers. I actually consider it the worst of the series. In typical Bond fashion, they have to dog on the Americans a little bit, and the American guy's like, oh, you flew us across the Atlantic pretty quickly. And the guys, the British guy's like, oh yeah, just trust the RAF. And then two seconds later, a couple dudes in leather jackets uh, hijack the space shuttle from on top of the 747. How they did this, I have no idea, but uh, they take it and they ignite the engines and they blast off from the back of the 747, destroying the 747 in the process. Pretty sure that's not how it worked. Not quite sure how these guys learned to operate the space shuttle or where they intend to land it but this is james bond makes for a pretty exciting opening sequence i actually really like this cold open wow what an opening to this film you gotta love jaws in this movie i know we all estimated that man with the golden gun was but no this one was dumb so dumb so my favorite bomb moment right at the beginning he jumps out of a plane without a parachute on james bond is in an airplane and he's making out with a flight attendant but she wants to murder him and the pilot wants to murder him so they shoot the controls of the airplane instead of shooting james bond and they're going to parachute out but oh no james bond gets in a fight with them and then there's a tussle meanwhile 
James flies off to England from wherever the hell he is. So we get another one of those great scenes where Em's asking Money Penny about Bond's status on the African job, and she says he's on his last leg. Yeah, last one, Miss Money Penny. Bond's on his last leg. Indeed he is. Indeed he is. He's feeling up all the legs. And of course we cut to him and a woman. Next we see what Roger Moore's up to. James Bond is currently making out with a hot girl who, of course, ends up being a spy that tries to kill him. Bond gets betrayed by the first girl he's seen making out with in the movie. This is kind of a theme for James Bond. And her hench buddy comes out and uh, Bond proceeds to beat the crap out of him, shove him off the plane. Bond being Bond. Ah. <sighs> All these women always trying to kill him. And he throws the guy out the window, and then Jaws is there because he was apparently on the plane, and now Bond and Jaws are both parachuting. Without parachutes. It's just... Steals parachute from someone else, and then evades being attacked by Jaws, who somehow ends up landing in a circus. He's got some really great moments, like when they're parachuting and he's trying to fly, and that doesn't work out. It definitely grabs your attention. There's a cool fight on on board the airplane, and then there's a really cool sequence where they're hanging out the airplane. They got some really awesome shots of these two guys kind of battling and hanging out the airplane. The fight ends up heading out into freefall, and uh, reading the the behind-the-scenes stuff on this, it took them like 80 jumps to make this scene happen. Listen, the parachuting looks really good, but it's just, I, I don't know, it starts off so ridiculous because, like, why didn't the flight attendant just shoot Bond? Why didn't the pilot just shoot Bond? Why didn't Jaws just shoot Bond? But remember where you bought the flight from? They double-crossed him, including a pilot, a stewardess, and Jaws! The actors are wearing parachutes underneath their suits, uh, and the one they're fighting over is just a dummy chute. But um, because you actually had to, like, jump out of an airplane with the camera and get close enough to film this stuff, this sequence took, uh, they said, 80 jumps before they could record the entire thing. But Bond jumps out of the airplane, he catches up to the pilot in free fall, grabs him, they're fighting over the parachute, it's really exciting, and then, out of nowhere, Jaws appears. So this movie has the return of Jaws. Then, oh hey look, it's Jaws. He's back, he's back in this movie, this is the Jaws movie, he was in um, The Spy Who Loved Me, and now he's back for this, he comes flying in from above uh, to get in on the action. It might not make a whole lot of sense, but I kind of love the fact that Jaws is a reoccurring henchman. It does feel like he should have been in more movies, though. Like, I always kind of wanted to see Oddjob or Baron Samedi make a reappearance. I'm actually pretty excited to see him back. Jaws, yeah, everyone loves Jaws. Remember that, because he's part of the damn movie. People have spoken. It's also why we get a space film instead of a spy film. Anybody could have killed Bond at any point in this process, and instead it leads to a parachuteless dive out of an airplane where Bond and Jaws are fighting over parachutes. We then have this really cool skydiving scene, which I think holds up pretty well. And it's cool that they actually, like, film skydivers, but this is a perfect example of why having a villain like Jaws can be a bit of a problem, because... The stunt double for Jaws looks absolutely nothing like Jaws. I think the stunt double is about five foot tall, and I'm pretty sure he's Asian, and he's definitely not Jaws. I mean, you know, there's the plane, there's the guy, there's who shoots the console, the plane's gonna crash. Bond jumps out of the plane after this man, the only one who's got a parachute. What happened to the what to the woman who's touching the leg? We never know. Apparently she turns into Jaws. We had a very good outfit on there. <laughs> yeah, and Jaws jumps out after him, he has a mid-air battle with this guy rips his parachute off, kicks him away, and then suddenly Jaws comes on, starts trying to bite his leg, so he pulls his parachute, and Jaws' parachute doesn't work, and he falls into a circus. I mean, sorry, is there anything better in life? Is there? That was amazing. And Jaws crashes into a circus tent. I sure hope the circus makes another appearance instead of just being kind of a random thing to put in this movie. (laughs) I actually, Looking back at the movie, when the military sees Drax's face, you'd think they could track a shuttlecraft taking off and landing somewhere. Honestly, they find a giant space base four seconds after it becomes visible to radar. You don't think they could just, you know, see a craft landing somewhere? From what I understand, NASA always wanted to try and figure out a way for a space shuttle to take off from the top of a plane. But I guess it never really worked out or is too risky or just way too expensive.
With that being said, this movie sucks. The song in Moonraker is really bland to me. They got Shirley ba- Bassey back again. And Shirley Bassey's great. We get the intro sequence. It's another Shirley Bassey song. It's not Goldfinger, but it's fine, perfectly serviceable. So once again, these opening titles just feel so generic. But the song is just, I mean, the only part of it I can remember is like the Moonraker. And I think it's bad because like, what the hell does Moonraker mean? Albert Broccoli can, uh, complained once that the uh, the intro sequence for Moonraker cost more than the entire budget for Dr. No. I don't know how true that is, but that's something that he was using when he was complaining about uh, the guy who put it together for him. I love James Bond. I love spy flicks. I don't mind some parts of the movie, but seriously, this is the worst of the series. And I know that like a lot of people on the podcast here did not like the last movie. I thought it was awesome. And this one, I think, is a real struggle. One area in which I do believe that Moonraker is an improvement over The Spy Who Loved Me is the theme song. That's right. Don't at me. I know you podcasters all loved it. I don't like the Carly Simon song. I'm into the Shirley Bassey one. What? And the lyrics make even less sense than usual. The song is terrible. The credits are terrible. They really tried to work in the title into the lyrics in this one, and I just don't think it works. They're trying to hold on to an old Bond thing here, and it's not working. Very like, hey, do you remember when we did Goldfinger? I think she says, just like a Moonraker. I don't know what a Moonraker is. Just like the Moonraker goes? But like, what the fuck is a Moonraker? I don't know. Anyway, Money Penny is old as hell in this movie. So the movie starts off with Bond meeting with M and Q, and we learn about the Drax Corporation. All right, so here's the plot. A shuttle disappeared, and also the guy who made the shuttle is a xenophobic asshole who wants to wipe out humanity and basically run the eugenics wars from Star Trek in space, and... He stole the shuttle to replace one of his shuttles that went missing. Hey, look at this. We're setting up a lot of plot for Mr. Drax. He's really rich. So then we get the obligatory exposition sequence where James Bond finds out that the wreckage of that 747 from the intro has been discovered, but the wreckage of the space shuttle is nowhere to be found. So somebody has stolen a space shuttle, and now James Bond has to go to California to talk to Elon Musk to try to recover it. And Bond has to go to California to find that out, and then to Venice, and then to Rio de Janeiro. That's all I got for the plot of this one, man. I don't know. This movie bored me to tears. I I, I hate to say it. I try to be positive on this show. Um, but man, a couple of these movies have just not done it for me. It opens up with James getting some new toys. And Bond gets this really sweet gadget. Uh, my favorite gadget is the wrist dart gun. It's a cyanide wrist dart. Including an armed dart gun that I completely forgot existed until like the third act. Ah, yeah, let's get the poison darts in for Christmas. I reckon it'll be a bestseller for the kids. They'll love it. You know, I've, I've already started making the adverts for it. Good suggestion, Bond. <laughs> this is probably going to be one of the best comedy films in Bond history. It's just amazing. And with this little wrist gun, Bond is now officially a web slinger. <laughs> That thing seems super impractical. I mean, you could set that thing off just going to shake someone's hand. Jesus, Q is sadistic. He uses it twice, I think, in this whole film. Uh, Once he accidentally shoots a painting in M's office, and the second time he uses it to um, stop the centrifuge um, from killing him. This is exactly why I'm not a super spy, because I would shoot myself in the foot with that thing. Anyways, we got Bond once again at the LAX airport in California. Then, Bond flies to the U.S. without Felix Leiter to greet him. I love the Moonraker factory. It's so cool. Just the little scale model. I, it's great. There's moving parts. It's great. To visit the stolen version of Versailles. So Drax's French mansion is supposed to be in Southern California? That the whole like gallivanting around the world bit. I mean, he goes like to the bad guy's mansion in California. This is peak Bond timeline here. Something in the Matrix broke. So we head to the perfect reproduction of a, a Parisian mansion where uh, Mr. Drax lives. 
nobody would ever be able to buy like Versailles and import it to the US. That looks so out of place. Rich people. Hey, hey, Mr. Drax. You must be a rich bastard. Oh, I bet he's pure evil. <laughs> it's like the 70s Elon Musk. Although, you know, <laughs> I don't think Elon Musk is evil. Is, is Elon Musk even the right person to think of? <laughs> but yes, you know, it's like if uh, Elon Musk was a man who only worked with good looking people. You know, we don't want any mutters in space now, do we? No, 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 no. But apparently it doesn't matter because Bond gets a helicopter pilot to fly him. It's very hot, like two movies in a row. Bond meets the vain villain Drax, who looks and acts like a villain. Mr. Drax has an incredible voice and is just a very menacing, he's a very good villain. Um, This movie is lacking in many capacities, but uh, Mr. Drax is not one of them. He looks like a bigger Peter Dinklage in a French palace serving Japanese tea. Rich people. His office is fun though, and he has like a complete Elon Musk vibe going on. But it's like super shady. We meet his strange Japanese henchman who uh, is really weird and um, Mr. Drax tries to force James Bond to eat cucumber sandwiches and drink tea. Bond uh, wisely declines. This guy in the karate uniform reminds me of one of Goldfinger's henchmen, and not in a good way. A woman doctor, says Bond. Hey, um, yeah, uh, yeah. And there's an undercover CIA agent named Dr. Holly Goodhead. Dr. Goodhead. Dr. Goodhead? Really? So then he has to go off to meet um, uh, the chief scientist for Mr. Drax, Dr. Holly Goodhead, which... uh... Bond meets Dr. Holly Goodhead, which, honestly, that's her name? Because her name's Goodhead. Do you get it? Good head. Right. Yeah, I'm not going to that route. <laughs> but she's an astronaut. That's progressive. And at this point, I just kind of want to mention that Moonraker is very similar to the previous Bond movie, um, The Spy Who Loved Me, except everything about it is like shittier and weirder. It starts with the shuttle being uh, captured, which the other one started with a submarine being captured. Space shuttle is much weirder and dumber. That's the one they went with for this. We meet Dr. Goodhead, who has a much sillier and dumber name than Anya Amasova. She also, we will discover, is a secret CIA agent, but she's not as good of an agent as Anya was. And um, the actress is not as talented as Barbara Bach was. Uh, And we're just going to see a lot of things that will keep coming up where it's just a crappy version of the last movie. And then Bond gets a tour of the facilities. So uh, Dr. Goodhead, you know... Nice pun there. Is she taking Bond on a little tour of this uh, space factory that this man has in his uh, imported 17th century French chateau? And Bond's being a right prick. <laughs> Ugh. Roger Moore mansplains constantly. <sighs> uh, I'd be really, really annoyed if he was on my tour route. Okay, so Bond is like a representative of the British government. You don't have to give him a dumb tour. Tell him what you think happened. Then the government will, like, you know, go away. Don't try and kill Bond on a centrifuge machine. So they put Bond into the centrifuge thing that they used to train the astronauts, and it looks kind of fun until they try to spin him to death and scramble his brains. I do really like this scene with the centrifugal generator. And he keeps trying to assassinate him. He tries to assassinate him with this weird centrifuge thing, which is a cool scene, admittedly. Made me freaked out about centrifuges when I was a kid. He's able to get out of it by using the the wristwatch uh, dart that he got from Q to blow up the controls and stop himself from dying. Man, it's a good thing that Q just so happened to give Bond a gadget that would only come in handy in this one instance. Weird how that keeps happening. Seriously, Bond uses his wrist gun to stop the gravity trigger eye, but still, sloppy Drax. It's an interesting death trap, but it's not a very exciting one. It's just a lot of watching Bond spin around in circles, which is not particularly heroic or exciting to watch after the first 75 to 80 seconds of it. If Bond is actually on a mission to review Elon's grounds, why is he riding the first roller coaster? So, he's being spun around in this G-Force machine, but what the hell do all these gauges and pressure things mean? None of them are labeled. Like... I'm supposed to be able to read this crap. 
<laughs> Who knows if it's overpowering, if it's overheating? Is it going too fast? Is it going too slow? Is there too much pressure in the uh, pressure department? <laughs> <laughs> is it too high, too low? Is it, you know, I used to, yeah, none of them are labeled. Like, this is the probably one of the worst machines ever made. No one's going to know what anything does. Terrible, 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 terrible. Once again, we're reminded why these films are each over two hours long. The G4 scene is a hair over five minutes, and that really dulled the tension for me. And then I love that when uh, Holly gets him out of the machine, she's like, oh, I don't know, something must have gone wrong with the controls. And meanwhile, James Bond is like barfing and like so dizzy he can barely stand up and he just pulled like 16 G's and nearly had like his brain splattered around the inside of the machine. Dr. Goodhead enters after the machine has already stopped and then she starts apologizing saying something must have gone wrong with the controls even though she was not in the room at the time now i think she was in on it because bond has been a straight dick to her this whole time anyway bond sleeps with the hot pilot so then bond hooks up with kareen the assistant she helps him steal info Basically, within 10 seconds, she just allows him to access the uh, secret safe that has all the access for the Moonraker plans. And this time, he has an even smaller safe cracker unit that we've seen in any other movie before. So Bond cracks Drake's safe and takes some pics with a camera. He takes photos of it with his 007 camera that has the numbers 007 written on it, and one of the O's is the uh, camera lens. Not just any camera but a 007 branded camera. Uh, he takes these pictures of it. She's like, no, no, don't do that. And then he does it, and then she lets him go. Drax will later be upset by this and have her eaten by dogs, but, like, she probably should have done a better job of preventing Bond from accessing the safe in the first place. But that seals her doom, because the next day, Bond is like, yo, I'm out, and Drax is like, let's go pheasant hunting. Then we are treated to like a seven and a half minute montage of people murdering birds. It's, you know, in California. I didn't know they actually hunted pheasants. But anyway. But then, like, so he knows that Bond is investigating him and he's openly trying to kill him. And Bond shows him that he knows this by killing one of his assassins in front of him. And then they keep being like, ah, good show, old sport. We'll keep sparring. Oh, yes, we'll be so witty and sparring as we do this instead of just, like, me pulling a gun and shooting you right here. I just, I don't... Drax has to kill Bond because we saw him sneaking around before, and then boom! Favorite kill? There wasn't much to it, but it happened when they were at Hugo Drax's palatial mansion, and Bond is asked to shoot Pheasant, and when he shoots, you assume that he totally missed his target, which we thought was the bird, but then you come to find out he perfectly shot the assassin that was hidden in the trees. Bond kills the shooter that's sitting in the tree. Mr. Drax eventually offers Bond the opportunity to murder some birds as well. But instead of shooting the birds, he shoots a sniper that was hiding in the trees waiting for him. But Bond leaves and the helicopter pilot dies trying to run from dogs that we never see again. Oh, poor nameless Bond girl. Oh my god, he set the dogs on her? Probably my favorite villain moment is when... Drax fires uh, a woman. The assistant who gave up the plans, uh, she shows up. Mr. Drax fires her and essentially releases dogs to chase her down and kill her in the forest. And then uh, Ramsey Bolton's her in the forest by having her chased and eaten by dogs. I mean, yeah, she betrayed him, but the dogs, you know? Now, one thing about this is that she drives up to Mr. Drax in a golf cart, gets fired, and then runs into the forest. For the sake of a dramatic exit, I understand why Corinne would not take the cart to escape and instead run. So, in theory, she has the keys to this golf cart and knows how to operate it. And presumably, if it's not faster than the dogs, it certainly can go distances longer than them. It would you definitely have a better fighting chance against two Rottweilers if you are if you're in a golf cart than if you are running through the forest in heels. And also, there's no resolution to these dogs. You know, normally Bond kills these things later on in the film, but he doesn't. These, these dogs are just here, where they get set up earlier on in the film, and then they get set on the, uh, the woman that Bond slept with and helped him break in and get some information that he wasn't entitled to. But the whole scene, albeit fairly long, is very dramatic. I realize at this point that a lot of the background music 
is super cool uh, and at the point in time in which it's implied she's murdered by the dogs they do the transition and bells ringing in the next scene so kudos to that uh, it's very villainous man they really stay on that scene for like a good long minute yeah it's just harrowing right? they go after her they chase her down through the woods you keep expecting Bond to come to her rescue and then you're kind of mad when he doesn't if it makes you feel any better those dogs have been dead for decades. He just leaves her to get eaten by dogs. And then, literally the scene after she dies, Bond's in Venice flirting with a blonde chick. You know, just goes to show that woman, woman, women, you should never succumb to Bond's penis. It will only involve you being set upon by dogs and eaten to death. Anyway, Bond figures out that Drax is building some random glass facility stuff in Italy. So Bond heads to Venice, which is uh, where there's a glass company. He found a clue in uh, Mr. Drax's safe that had plans to Moonraker, and these plans point to Venice. So Bond goes there. So rather than paying to have machine precision glass made to hold these special canisters, which, um, you know, seems to hold this... uh, plot point later on, uh, but he, rather than having them precision made by machine, or he pays extra to have them hand-blown by some guys in Venice. I mean, Drax is paying extra for something that won't be as perfect as something that was made by a machine. Just what a villain. He investigates the glass blowing factory because Venice is known for glass blowing, uh, and then he runs into Holly. I'm not going to call her Dr. Goodhead anymore, like Please don't make me say that again. He goes there, goes on a tour of the plant, running into Goodhead, because surprise, she's a spy. Oh my god, Bond is so condescending to uh, Dr. Goodhead. Oh god, how? You know, I'd have to be condescending to Dr. Goodhead, I think. <laughs> now, my wife's a doctor. If I spoke to her like that, uh, well, she wouldn't be my wife for very much longer. Yeah, I'd be a, a very lonely man. Very, very lonely man. Anyway, Holly is there for a conference, but Bond already has figured out that she's CIA, uh, so he starts following her. I'm noticing that Bond goes to Venice a lot. You gotta love how this gondola operator knows exactly where to be to pick Bond up. And then, for some reason that is not quite explained, he decides he's going to go for a ride by himself in a gondola. Bond has one of the worst chase scenes in a Bond movie, the gondola ride. What is even happening in this movie? (gasps) Oh, this boat chase through through Venice is epic. Coming down the canal the other direction is another gondola that has a coffin in it. And as that coffin passes James Bond, the coffin lid opens. It's completely lined with weapons. And there's a dude in there that tries to throw knives at James Bond. The dude in the coffin with the knives. You know, there's a guy comes out of a coffin, throwing knives. Bond grabs on the knife, throws it back, kills him, and he falls back into the casket, and then he falls into the river. Now, what was the plan here? So there's a guy, and he puts himself in a coffin, and he presumably has some way of looking out so that he can see when he's going to pass James Bond coming the other direction. I don't... The logistics of just that seem very complicated to me. And then when the lid pops up, and the dude pops up, he's got a knife in each hand, he throws one to kill the gondola operator first, and it's a perfect shot, and the second one, I think he might throw two at Bond that both kind of deflect off the side of the gondola. So, like, I mean, maybe bring a gun, or, like, you know, there has to be a better way to do this. There has to be some way where you can, like, be a little bit more guaranteed to get the kill, or... Otherwise, just do what the other guys are doing and drive up behind him with a machine gun. That didn't work either, but at least, like, it makes sense. Favorite vehicle? I'm going to choose the gondola that turns into a speedboat that turns into a hovercraft. Bond doesn't get a car in this movie. He gets a motorized gondola. Oh, that's just terrible. Anyway, now we have a chase sequence in the uh, in the canals of Venice. James Bond's gondola. He referred to it, uh, Roger Moore referred to it as the bondola, which I like. It's got a 
like a motorized outboard engine on it, and it is just flying down the canals, except that the rules of Venice, uh, you aren't allowed to take a boat faster than five knots, which is about five miles an hour. So they had to film this entire sequence in pretty much slow motion and then speed it up in post. Uh, but rem remember when I said that Moonraker is just like shitty spy who loved me? This is a good example of that, right? You had the, the Lotus Esprit that could turn into a submarine, and in this one, you have a gondola that turns into a speedboat and then turns into a hovercraft, and none of them go more than five knots. It's, it's that, right? That perfectly encapsulates the difference between Moonraker and um, The Spy Who Loved Me. And somehow makes it through those tiny little streets of Venice. The gondola gets shot up in a drive-by casket, but also the bon gondola is motorized and also a hovercraft? Wait. This gondola has a motor? The boat is just like, you know, suddenly he's on the gondola, and the next minute the gondola seems to have some sort of motorboat engine. You know, I don't remember Q bringing him his boat. Did I miss that bit? Yeah, and then, like I said, it's somehow there's a motor engine on this gondola, which has all the Bond's gadgets in it. He's driving all the way around Venice. Calling it right now, favorite gadget of this entire movie, the hover gondola. And then suddenly he gets to San Mark Square, flicks a switch, boom, hovercraft. Hilarious. And he starts just causing havoc around St. Smart Square. It's just amazing. So, so fun. Did they just do a pigeon double take sequence? They definitely did do a pigeon double take. But it's just so good. Another fun behind the scenes note of this is that uh, when uh, the gondola inflates and Bond drives up onto the shore, they had to do five takes of that because the first four takes, the gondola didn't inflate properly and it, uh, it dumped Roger Moore into the water. And then they had to have like a makeup team come reapply makeup. He had to change into a fresh suit and uh, get dried off before they could attempt the sequence again. Uh, and it, on the fifth take, he didn't get dumped into the canal. Funny story. The wine drinker in the square is the same wine drinker in the beach scene of A Spy Who Loved Me. But anyway, we get a rehash of some of the same gags we saw when he drove the Lotus out of the ocean in the last one. Uh, a bunch of people pouring beers on each other or check looking at their drinks to make sure that they're not completely hallucinating uh, a dude driving out of the water. During this boat chase scene, there's a nice funny little bit where a smoker peers over one of the bridges into the water and sees the previously ejected coffin floating there. And he's continuing to cough through the whole scene and just chucks his cigarette. And that's a pretty funny anti-smoking ad right there. Uh, like I said, same as uh, Spy Who Loved Me, but worse. 